to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hello, OnScript listeners. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Matt Lynch coming to you from Regent College in Vancouver. I'm a host along with Matt Bates, Drew Johnson, Aaron Heim, Chris Tilling, Amy Brown Hughes, and Jules Martinez Olivieri. We are a collective that is interested in biblical studies and theology and the intersection between them. In this episode, Charles Halton is going to be talking about divine embodiment in the Bible and its potential implications for theology. So it's a synthetic project that he's undertaking and uh, we hope you find it interesting and enjoy it. Um, also, thanks so much to everyone who's given to the podcast. If you would like to support what we're doing, then you could go to onscript.study forward slash donate. If you're not able to, then maybe you could, um, you know, as we get into the holiday season, wrap up a, a card in a box so it looks like a present and put our, our website address on it, put it under the tree, and then when your kids open it, they'll... Uh, you know, they'll be surprised and delighted and um, maybe tell some of their friends about because I think the younger generation uh, needs to know more about theology and biblical studies and what better way to implement the Deuteronomy 6 vision of talking about these things when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up uh, to that next generation than by putting it in a present. And And kids are so you know, caught up with the materialism of Christmas and and I think steering them towards some theology would be a, a really good way to overcome that. So we hope you enjoy this episode and thanks so much for listening. Hello everyone and welcome back to the OnScript podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Charles Halton. He is Associate Rector of Christ Church Cathedral in Lexington, Kentucky. He's an external affiliate at the Center of the Social Scientific Study of the Bible at St. Mary's University in Twickenham. He is a founder and was managing editor and director of media for the Marginalia Review of Books, which is part of the LA Review of Books now. He edited a book called Genesis History Fiction or Neither or Neither, and uh, it was or is co-author, editor, and translator with Sana Svard of Women's Writing and of Ancient Mesopotamia, an anthology of the earliest female authors. He also translated the cuneiform collection of the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. And we're here to talk about his book, A Human-Shaped God, Theology of an Embodied God. Charles, welcome to OnScript. Thanks, Matt. It's good to be here. So first of all, I'm wondering if you could tell me a bit about your journey toward biblical studies and the study of the ancient Near East, because it seems like a lot of your earlier academic work was in Mesopotamian literature, cuneiform texts, and things like that. What what drew you into that area of academic work? Well, I wanted to teach theology when I was kind of in late high school, and so trying to prepare for that and being kind of a goal-minded person, I kind of set a little path for me to try to get to that point. And uh, I went to college, studied marketing, because as I looked at the curricula, I thought if I did religion as an undergrad that I would duplicate that for a seminary degree. So I did marketing, had a great time, and then I went to seminary, did that. And while in seminary, I went to the dean of the MDiv program, and asked to get an exemption to not study Hebrew. And uh, he said, nope, sorry, everybody who's in your degree program has to have two semesters of one language and one semester of the other language, those languages being Greek and then Hebrew. And, um, you know, I tried a little harder to negotiate my way out of it. And I, and I said, you know, I'm doing theology. I don't need Hebrew for that. And, uh, <laughs> and he said, no. You're going to have to do that. And so I took my first semester at seminary. I took a Hebrew class because I figured, okay, I'll get this over with. Um, I don't want to do it, so I'll just get it done. And I took that class and absolutely loved it. It was incredible. And it opened my eyes to really this enchanted world of the Bible that I didn't have access to before. 
And I decided that I wanted to do a PhD in this. And I still kept my interest in theology, but taking that first Hebrew class reshaped how I approached theology. I really, you know, realized what I should have realized all along is that I needed to have the right tool set in place to do theology well. And in, in my understanding at that moment, it was getting the biblical languages um, down and, and, and really learning those well. So that could kind of be a foundation of my theological reflection later in life. So I did that. I wanted to do Hebrew, but then I kept reading in all these commentaries, these uh, interpreters talking about, oh, this Hebrew word's related to this Akkadian word, or it's related to this, you know, whatever, Ugaritic word. So then I thought, well, maybe I need to learn all those too. And so <laughs> that kind of one thing led to another. And I did a PhD in um, Bible and Asian Near East, specializing in cuneiform studies. And tell me about your translation of the tablets from the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. How did that come about? That came about because I was looking for a dissertation topic, and my supervisor had publication rights to that collection. And it was a collection of tablets that the Carnegie Museum had bought like 100 years ago, but no one had translated them. No one even knew what they said. And my supervisor just said, hey, do you want to do this? And, you know, it felt like something to get me through. And uh, so, and it sounded interesting, you know, I could kind of be Indiana Jones without the manual labor. And I went up to uh, Pittsburgh several times and photographed the whole collection and then translated those tablets. They were mostly economic tablets, as almost all cuneiform tablets are. You'd have to get incredibly lucky to get anything that is literary or otherwise. But uh, yeah, it was fun. It was exciting. So, so no uh, ancient flood myth? Another no, version sadly, of, yeah, no. Yeah. I would be a household name right now if, yeah. if, that, were, if that were the case. Yeah, that sort of Irving Finkel moment. Exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then uh, are you still involved with the Marginalia Review of Books or is that all handed off now? No, no, we handed that off a while okay. ago. It was me and a few buddies started that and um, then life kind of got in the way. And um, But I had a great time with it. It was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I was, um, I was in Göttingen with Michael Law who... You okay. was one, um, co-founded that with, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember the day you hit, um, you know, go live with oh, that. Ah, nice. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it must have been, that was an exciting moment, I know, for him. And uh, that that publication really took off. And, and to get it, was it acquired uh, by LA Review Books? No, it's, a, it's like a affiliate relationship. So they keep their editorial independence, but... Um, LARB hosts the site and publicizes it. It's sort of a, you know, collaborative. They have like a PBS type of model where you have these independent PBS stations, but that they're related to kind of the PBS system. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about your book, A Human Shaped God. Um, I was initially interested in, in this book because I, I teach a seminar here at Regent called Divine Presence in the Old Testament. And we spend a lot of time in that class talking about divine embodiment. And so when I saw your book, A Human Shaped God, and, and also the fact that you were interested in some of the theological implications of that, uh, which I am also interested in how you know, we are talk about God's body then has implications theologically and ethically. Um, <clears throat> and so um, I, I'm curious about, you know, your choice to focus on divine embodiment it was not driven just out of this curiosity of the fact that ancient Israelites seem to think God had a body, but it's also, you know, you're addressing certain apprehensions or misunderstandings that people have about God as God's depicted in the Bible. So what are some of those apprehensions you were seeking to address or misunderstandings you were wanting to address in this book? Yeah, there are quite a few of them, really. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them stem from my discernment that um, European-inspired Christianity followed a path very early that was centered on this platonic idea of who God was and kind of a platonic orientation to the universe. And by that, I mean, 
that God in God's essence is simple. And so God is non-complex in the sense of um, God doesn't move. And that's really, I, as I look at it, the impetus for saying that God is simple, that God doesn't change, God doesn't move, and things like this. And so that idea of divine simplicity really came to dominate the institutional forms of European related religious uh, ideas. And what happened, I think, is that I don't have necessarily a problem with that kind of idea if it's formulated well, but it causes people to read the Bible poorly in the sense of, in my opinion, it makes people read the Bible in a very tendentious way where they want to prove that God is not complex. And so when we get to these passages, particularly in the Old Testament, but New Testament too, that seem to indicate that God has multiple emotions going on at the same time, or God has, you know, these non-simple aspects or competing aspects of God's character come into play. They have highly developed interpretive systems to negate that reading and to lead people in different readings that very often mean the exact opposite of what the stories say on the surface. And so I just, after being in the field for a long time and seeing this play out a lot, it, it seemed to me that it, these ideas were preventing people from just naturally reading the Bible and encountering the presentation of God in it. And so I wanted to, in a sense, free us from that. And to say, what if we just read these stories as they seem to flow and not have that anxiety or tension about not being able to read um, a God who's complex? And, and what's an example from, let's say, the Old Testament of a text that people would tend to read against the grain of that text? You know, like, wh wh what are some things that people are, are trying to say, you know, this doesn't really say what you think it says? Um, God must actually be otherwise. A classic example of this is these passages that are often translated as God regretted doing something. And so you get this like in Noah's flood, where God brings this cataclysmic flood into the world, and the only humans who survive this are Noah and his family, and these select animals that are brought on this ark. And then afterwards, the text of Genesis says God regretted doing that, is how that's translated oftentimes. And so what happens then is that various people argue, well, you shouldn't translate that as regret, and they offer other translation um, opportunities for it. Or they say, the reason why it says regret is because that's the only way humans can understand what happened. And God really didn't regret what God did, but from humanity's perspective, it seemed like that's what happened. So it's a language of accommodation. Language of accommodation is often labeled as anthropomorphism. And so they get to these portions of the Bible where God appears to be a human, in this instance, conflicted. You know, God did something, and after the fact, God says, oh man, maybe I shouldn't have done that. And so that reveals this kind of conflicted nature of God. And so historically, theologians would identify that as an anthropomorphism. And then if they identify it as an anthropomorphism, they then have rhetorical and interpretive strategies to say, well, it's really not anthropomorphism. It's the exact one of the opposite. God never changed. The only thing that changed is humanity. Um, or th there are various other strategies people use. But um, it's essentially identify it as anthropomorphism and then deny it's anthropomorphism. Mm -hmm. and, and you talk about the the hermeneutical principle of reading unclear text in light of clear text, and, and you said that the tendency is to call texts that use language of divine embodiment unclear, and then texts that uh, make a more, you, you could say, abstract statement or something more direct, the clear text, and then sort of use those to read read those texts that portray divine embodiment and and, and, and eclipse them, essentially. Exactly. And on its surface, it seems really uncontroversial to say, 
you should start out with the clear text and have that as your baseline interpretation. And then for the unclear text, you interpret in light of that. That seems totally common sense and, and clear. The problem is in practice is that the clear text happen to be the ones that agree with my preconception of who God is. And the unclear texts so often happen to be presentations of God that are different than how I want God to be. And so I think the problem comes into how do we choose which texts are clear and which are not. Yeah, I mean, the to say God regretted actually isn't that unclear. Um, and, and so it's more a matter of, it might be unclear what you do with that, uh, given your theological assumptions. But on the surface, there's nothing unclear about that. And, and that seems to be a case with a lot of these texts, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You spend a good deal of time talking, uh, I think it's the first chapter, uh, about human senses and how that impacts the way we do theology. And I, I didn't totally expect that. I, I expected you to launch right into portraits of God and God's body in the Old Testament. So why did you bother talking about human senses? I mean, you have a, you have a whole section on how we see color and um, even at one point get into animals and their religious sensibilities. So w what does that have to do with um, the question of divine embodiment? Well, so what I try to do in the book is offer a way to understand God that in a sense works backwards and reverse engineers who God is starting from humanity. And that may seem like a weird thing to do, but we have these texts in Genesis that talk about humans being made in God's image. And what was really striking to me is in the history of Old Testament scholarship, there are almost 30 or more explanations of what that means to be made in God's image, but none of them <laughs> ever say we physically resemble who God is. The shape of the human body, the structure of who we are as beings in some way reflects who God is. People say it's our rationality, it's our capacity for relationship, it's all these myriad of things, but uh, it comes down to them trying to say, let's find out something that's different in humans from the rest of the animals. And then we'll say that's what the image of God is. However, later in Genesis, the same word for image of God is used as um, one of uh, Adam's sons, Seth. And it says, Seth is made in his father's image, which I think means Seth just as a chip off the old block looks like his father. And so I said, if we're going to translate it this way, in every single other time we approach that expression, then why are we translating and interpreting it differently here. And so I tried to have consistency in how we approach this. And so if humans are made in God's image, then we can, the more we understand about how humans function, the more windows we get into how God functions and who God is. That was kind of my idea with that. Yeah. I mean, so that, so that will push against the, the, the qualitative distinction between God and humans, you know, the idea that God is fundamentally different from humans. And so would you say that's an unhelpful theological category for reading the biblical text? Is that, does that get in the way of, of seeing what the Bible is doing? Or, or is there a way to navigate those two? There's a way to navigate it. It's not unhelpful if done well. So what I find really fascinating about the Christian like religion, is that it's super complicated and very sophisticated. And so we have these ideas embedded within core classical theology that can help us navigate this. So something like the Trinity, which is, you know, one sort of center of consciousness and three iterations of that. That, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't go together, you know, um, but yet it does mystically, uh, mysteriously. You have God's utter transcendence and God's utter eminence going together. Those, those things don't match, but somehow theologically they do. You have Jesus' divine nature, you have Jesus' human nature. How they fuse together in one entity, who knows? But so you have all of these paradoxes, all of these like parallel ways of being. And in my book, I talked about light and how light acts as both a wave and a particle. And these are two completely contradictory ways of existing. And yet, um, as Albert Einstein, many others observed, we can't understand light if we don't understand it simultaneously as a wave and a particle, even though we have no way 
to explain how that happens. So that's what I think we should do with God is be okay with the contradiction, be okay with the tensions, be okay with the mysteries. And so, yes, God is totally other, above, different than humanity, and yet God is fundamentally similar to humanity in ground-level ways. And how that goes together, I have no idea, but the but the scriptural authors never, or very rarely, it tried to, you know, um, reconcile that. So, pastorally speaking, I'm wondering how that plays out. So, you know, it's one thing to say in a book, we've got to hold these tensions. And I, I totally agree that there are many aspects of the, theological discourse where we're saying one thing on the one hand and another on the other hand, and we don't know how the two fit together. Um, so is it a matter of discerning in a pastoral moment what aspect of your uh, complex theological system to deploy or to emphasize? Or how, you know, how do you think about the, like, the practical outworking of that way of holding contradictions? Yeah, I, th- I think there's a lot of way, a lot of ways it comes into play. I think one of them is that, and that is part of the skill of a uh, practitioner of practical theology is to know what facet of theology is helpful in a particular circumstance. But that's what a physicist does. You know, when you're examining light and you have a particular experiment that you want to perform, you have to know how to set up the experiment to have a useful outcome. Um, and know what instruments to use to detect what you're trying to detect and so on. And and, and, and in some ways, I think it's like that too theologically, that there are moments in our lives where we need God's transcendence and there are moments where we really need to feel God's eminence. And um, knowing that situation helps us bring those stories and aspects of God to bear. But I think also, even more fundamentally though, is it should lead us to... Um, a level of humility when we approach these things. Um, there are a lot of theologians, and perplexingly, some of these theologians, even like Augustine, who went on to have really contentious debates with people in his time, you know, that mm-hmm. were kind of rude. Uh, <laughs> when you want to, to say to the least, of, to say the least. Yeah. Um, but you know, he had these expressions like, "If you." can explain who God is, you haven't explained God. You're not, you're not describing God because God is above these explanations. Um, and so I think in his better days, he had a uh, humility in saying, you know, we can try to explain who God is, but we cannot fundamentally capture God. And I think that's something that this helps theologically is that God is not our um, being to bring to, into our control. Um, God does remain mysterious and our, you know, knowledge is not expansive. It's very limited. And, uh, there, you know, several biblical stories that try to bring that to the front as well. Yeah. So let's talk about God, uh, as an embodied being. So what are you saying when you say that, or what are the biblical writers saying when they depict God with a body? Yeah, I think, I, I think, I think biblical authors had several different things depend who they were that they could mean by this um so it's not necessarily saying that god has has skin and bones and muscles like we do although some of them perhaps could because i think some ancient near you know ancient mediterranean people did think of god in those ways and so it's certainly possible that um some of the israelites thought that and i think probable that some of them thought that as well but what I'm really talking about is terminology that I got from Benjamin Somer. He's a uh, Old Testament scholar, and it's uh, it being embodied as being located in a particular place at a particular time. And uh, so we see this all across the Old Testament, like the idea that God's living in the temple in Jerusalem, and people go up to Jerusalem because it's high elevation in order to worship. You know, they don't. They don't have a sacrificial offering in their home. They they go to where God lives, and that's where they meet God at the temple. And that's a picture of divine embodiment. And those types of embodiments, locations in a specific time, in a specific place, are all across the Old Testament. So we have another very paradigmatic example of this 
when the Hebrews are marching out of Egypt through the Sinai wilderness area, and God appears to them in several ways, but one of them is by a cloud um, of fire by night and a smoke by day, and to lead the people out like that. So, in, so that's God in a particular place at a particular time. It's this idea that um, God is not just this free-floating, disembodied spirit that is nowhere but everywhere. Yeah, so um, do you, one of the things that strikes me about a lot of those depictions of God is the way that those passages will portray God as located, present, embodied, but also seem to preserve an element of mystery about the nature of that appearance. So like, think um, I'm thinking of God on Sinai where where they see his feet and legs or whatever it is they see there, um, but not the entirety of God's body or, you know, the even God's presence in the temple is shrouded by a cloud and this brilliant light. So there's both mystery and presence. Do you think that's trying to say something theologically or is it just emphasizing embodiment? I think there's always a mysterious element to who God is. And I think personally, the, the moment that we think we have got all figured out is when we're at our most susceptible to problems. <laughs> and so I, I do think that throughout scripture, there does seem to be this like mysterious nature for who God is. We get a glimpse of God and then God disappears. Um, and so, yeah, I, I certainly think that's part of it. Yeah. And also Jacob wrestling this ish, this man, or is it God he saw, or like you said in Hosea, is it a a malach, a messenger. <laughs> so, so there's this, uh, there's a, there's a kind of slippage between who exactly people are even encountering in some instances. Yep. And I think, and part of the reason why I wrote this book too is because Benjamin Somer had this almost throwaway phrase in his book on divine embodiment, where he said, "I wonder why Christians don't understand and make a bigger deal out of divine embodiment, because." It, it makes sense that Jesus would be an extension of who God already is in the Old Testament. And so I kind of grabbed onto that and tried to say, okay, well, let's, let's take some, make some theology out of that. And so even in the New Testament, Jesus remains really mysterious to people. And even his contemporaries don't quite know what to make of the guy. And so I think that kind of idea of like, you know, I have a relationship with this with this God, this 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 person. I, I don't quite know who this is, but it's someone who's familiar yet very different. Yeah, yeah. And and you would think um, as Christians we'd be more than comfortable with that because I, I'm thinking not just of the sort of moment of the incarnation and Jesus' presence in Israel in the first century, but. But the uh, the idea of the eternal humanity of Christ, I mean, that's a very mysterious concept. The, the idea that Jesus eternally has a human body is, but yet is not someone we can easily locate <laughs> or locate at all. So, I mean, that that doctrine of the eternal humanity of Christ should allow us or open us up at least to this idea of, a, of an embodied God who's also transcendent and present with Israel, but yet God of the nation. You know, the, holding those together is very difficult, but but yet something that's affirmed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I wonder if we could switch and do a speed round. Um, okay. What's um, one idea in biblical studies or theology that you think needs to die? Inerrancy, and I'm happy to elaborate or not. No, that's fine. You don't, you don't need to. If you want to, you can. But I think this idea that there was a, a pristine autograph at some point that was perfect. Um, it's just uh, writing in the ancient world to me was a communal endeavor, and it was something that was changing and shifting as it was passed down. And this notion of individual ownership and authorship of a uh, work of literature was it the earliest a Roman conception and um, really doesn't come to full fruition until I think the Industrial Revolution. 
And so I think even our perception of what authorship was in the ancient world has to change. Right. Well, there's your next book. All right. What, what's <laughs> the uh, most significant book in biblical studies in the last 50 years? Oh, golly. I have no clue. But I love Michael Fishbane's book, Sacred Attunement. Um, I, I think that the title captures for me theologically what my life is about and what my theological endeavor is about of attuning oneself to God's rhythms and patterns. And I think that language is incredibly helpful. How do you solve a problem like Maria? Solve a problem like Maria? Yeah. How do you solve a problem like Maria? Um, um, uh, sound of music reference here. I don't remember. I know the sound of music, but I must have seen it many yeah. years ago. I don't know. <laughs> There's no right answer there. All right. Uh, what's love got to do with it? Everything. We're, we're going into, we're descending into the joke category here. Okay. Uh, how does Moses make his coffee? Uh, with the burning bush. That's a good thought. He brews it. Okay. How, how does he make, uh, how does he make his go. beer? Uh, you got me. Same way. All right. There you um, go. What's your, do you have a favorite novel? You seem very widely read. I was noticing in your book, like your footnotes are not all biblical scholars. And that, that was refreshing. In fact, I would say half of them aren't. Um, where, you know, you're citing scientists and poets and novelists. So I'm curious, what, what's your favorite novel? You know, I think one of the most amazing novels I've ever read is Time's Arrow by Martin Amos. And uh, the whole novel is written backwards. And so you read it forwards, but yet the time frame is all backwards. And it's an entire novel and it fits. It's mind-blowing how he did it. Time's Arrow. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a favorite poetry collection or favorite poet? Yeah, a good friend of mine, Dave Harity, is a great poet. He mm -hmm. lives in Louisville. And uh, I love his work. Do you have a um, teacher that perhaps has had the greatest impact on you? Mm, man, um, you know, probably Daniel Block. He was a Old Testament and theology professor for me and really uh, encouraged me to go where scripture went. So Very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think very highly of him. Uh, favorite ancient Near Eastern writing? Uh, I have to say, in Hedwana's Temple Hymns, because uh, I edited those things, so I came very intimately aware of them. And uh, they're interesting. She's, she's doing a lot of profound things with those things. And you drew an interesting parallel between them in Genesis 1 and 2. Do you want to just yeah. spell that out briefly? So, in Hedwana was sent... Her her dad was this conquering king, and he conquered this other territory, and he sent his daughter there to be the head priestess at this conquered area. And I think part of her job was to try to unify the new empire and help people realize that their religious observances between these two areas um, were similar. And so she compiled these hymns to all the temples of this new empire. And there were two different temples, both in this northern and southern area, that claimed to be the place where the universe was created, the belly button of the world, as they called it. And both of these temples claimed that. So when she started her temple collection, she put those as hymn number one and hymn number two. And it's fascinating because to a modern reader, that makes no sense. Those are com competing, conflicting claims. And yet, that's how she structured this. And I saw that similar to Genesis 1 and 2, where you have different orders of creation where humans and animals are flipped in each one of those stories. And so that's a contradiction. In most, in even many Bible translations, even now, and the ESV is very funny because they released their first edition, which grammatically preserved that contradiction. But then they went back and changed it and uh, changed their translation in a second uh, kind of printing to harmonize the two stories, uh, you know, probably because marketing purposes and yada, yada. But um, so I saw a parallel in, in 
and putting competing, conflicting stories together to start out your religious collection. And it wasn't a problem for ancient people. It wasn't a problem, but it's a problem for us now. Right. And this, this gets at something I was wondering about. Um, you talk, and we've discussed already, you talk a good deal in the book about contradictory portraits of God and, um, and what we do with those. And and one of the questions I had was, to what extent do you think the Bible invites the mere holding of a contradiction versus the synthetic work of, of um, I don't want to say melding, but bringing together two se- seemingly contradictory portraits of God? Um, so so the, one, the one idea is just that they're in opposition, deal with it. <laughs> the other one is they must fit together somehow because they're part of the same belief system. I might not know totally what that involves, but I'm going to work at thinking together with these. You know, you know what I mean? So how, to what extent do you think Bible invites one versus the other? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually think different authors within the Bible had different perceptions of, and it would offer different responses to that question. So I think you have um, a, a person like um, the chronicler who who liked to harmonize things and liked to have a nice, consistent uh, presentation. Yeah, do you want to give an example of that? Because that was helpful in the book. Well, so you have various laws or instructions, as I as I like to translate, and it's how Daniel Block uh, translates it too. I, I love that. You know, um, these instructions on how to how to cook meat. And so you have some that say you cannot use water, and that's the foundational thing. You roast it over fire. No water is used. And then others say, you know, boil it. So the Chronicle looked at that and said, oh, we can't have two contradictory ways of how to do a sacrifice. This is terrible. So how about we boil it over fire? And so what he did was combine those two elements together, but it doesn't work because one of them clearly says no water. That's the whole basis of the instruction. Um, but what I thought was interesting is that this, I, the, the, the majority kind of view that shook out of scripture compiling was that it's okay to keep these disparate understandings. And they had that so strongly that they kept the chronicler who tried to get rid of them. And, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's just, it's this holistic eye. So I look at it almost like this. I'm an Episcopalian priest. And uh, sort of the whole Episcopal tradition arose out of conflict in England, where they tried to bridge warring parties together and have a big tent to hold people together. And they held people together through a rhythm of prayer and um, not necessarily belief structure. There are some beliefs that are held in common, but they're kind of you know, vague. They're not really enforced a lot, all that kind of stuff. The real thing is this rhythm of prayer Um, and I think that's more of what the biblical community had where they had more of a freedom and openness to how people view and understand who God is, but these kind of rhythms of communal practice were the main things that held them together. And again, that's not exclusive. I mean, there are some things that you just kind of have to think about to have coherence as you navigate through the world. So I'm not saying, you know, some biblical scholars say, you know, it was all just ritual, and, and it wasn't theology at all. And you have some people say, oh, no, it's theology. You have to believe right. And I think it's a combination of the two. But exactly how that matrix shapes out, I don't know exactly. But um, I I think that a lot of these accounts in the Bible are not necessarily made to produce one unified picture of who God is, but they are... Um, springboards for theological imagination uh, to help us, the future people in the religious community of their day, imagine who God is in productive ways. Um, so when, when discussing God's mind, you use the example of Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, where you know, there's something God sees. Well, he has to go down to investigate. He has to come to find out about what's going on there. And, and you talk about some other examples in the Old Testament where God comes to know things. And 
And that will be a surprising idea for some listeners that that God has to come to know things. So, what do you what do these portraits tell us about biblical conceptions of God's mind? Um, and what would you say are some of the theological implications of those passages? So I think, number one, it helps us read the stories better. So like in Zechariah, God has these messengers who go out and search over the world and report back what's happening. And you have this happen several times throughout Scripture, these you know messengers, these angels. And so what's the point of those things? So a lot of them are like scouts. So number one, it helps us read the stories well in like a more non-tendentious way. Number two, I think that it helps us understand the New Testament better because Jesus grew in knowledge with Jesus' own sufferings. And that's a really weird passage that's perplexed interpreters for ages. But it it does, it shouldn't, if we have this idea already that's embedded in the Old Testament that God doesn't know everything at the outset. Um, God is in this experiential matrix that we are as well. And God comes to know things as we do too. So this could be the choices that people make. You know, God may have a probability structure of like, you know, like you would a friend of yours to say, yeah, I think that guy's going to choose this. But until that person actually chooses that, it's not a real choice yet in one sense. And so it seems that for many of the stories of the Bible, that's the same kind of way that God approaches that situation. I think, though, the theological or one theological result of this is that one way of reading the Bible is to see God on this arc of almost um, self-improvement or becoming God's best self, as you know people would say uh, today or whatever. But it's it's God's coming into God's own in this relationship that God has with God's created order, where God comes into a deeper, more loving, more understanding relationship, even with God's own self and with these things that God's created, as time goes on and as experience happens. Just like I think maybe ideally a married couple would do that over the course of 40 or 50 years. They would come to a deeper understanding of one another. They may never fully understand one another because I think that's also part of this whole mix is humans, even the closest to us, they can also, like God, be familiar and yet mysterious to us. Um, but we can have this, you know, almost like a softening of the relationship if it's done well with somebody else over time. We have a more understanding, more loving, more charitable, more merciful disposition toward that person. And I think we see that arc in Scripture. Let me give you one example of this. We have various people who are excluded from the community of God in some of the Old Testament instructions, like Moabites, Ammonites, things like this. They're said to, you know, they can never be part of God's worshiping community. But what happens? Over time, they become part of the worshiping community. And notably, Ruth is you know, the great-great-grandmother of David, who is the king of Israel. You don't get more included into a people than giving birth to the eventual king. And so... How did that happen? There, there, there are several ways that you could explain it, and I don't necessarily have beef with any of them. But one way that makes sense is that God had a softening, that um, something happened. God learned something about the Moabite people that then made God say, yeah, they should be part of this special worshiping community too. Um, and uh, I don't say that in isolated incidents because I, because I think there's several other um, categories of people who have that same trajectory. And so I think that's actually a pattern in Scripture. And so determining those patterns, I think, is important. So again, an implication of that is that we as human people, if we're going to imitate God, we need to be on that similar arc as well. That those who we consider our enemies or excluded from our groups we should, over time, come to a position of inclusion, of loving those people more deeply, of seeing them as our own and not as an adversarial party. And um, so I, I think pastorally, that's a really important thing to see that arc. The other response that I've seen is, you know, 
uh, patrolling the boundaries and hardening up and saying, no, it's right to exclude those people. Um, and But there are just these exceptions for these other people. And so now, therefore, we have the right and even the moral obligation to exclude all these other people, treat them as hostile, and things like this. It's a profoundly different way of reading. And I think at the end of the day, what I noticed is that some of these hermeneutical strategies that I talk about in the book that I'm trying to kind of deconstruct, these ways of interpreting scripture that denies God's humanity, they're really not ultimately about denying God's humanity. They're about giving us license to deny the humanity of other people. And so if God is seen as doing that, then we can imitate God and not feel guilty when we dehumanize other people. And, um, so I, I I think, and I'm not trying to, um, you know, blame individual scholars for that because I was involved in that interpretive, uh, kind of mentality for a long time. And I didn't consciously realize that I was trying to dehumanize other people. But I think those types of, um, interpretive strategies don't necessarily end up in that way, but it's almost like they're designed um, to portray a God who's like that, you know? And what I started to realize, especially after I had a child was like some of these, um, ideas people had about God, like I would never tell my kid to act this way. And if I acted that way as a parent to my kid, I'd be locked up in jail. But yet people have these imaginations that, you know, God is like this, you know? And I was like, if God exists, God needs to be better than me, not worse than me, you know? And so how can I read scripture so God's better than me, <laughs> you know? So that, that was one of, the, one of the ideas behind the book too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the ethical implications of our theology, it, it's often an area we don't really work out. And I suppose too, we don't always know the consequences of our theology, and, and some of those unintended consequences emerge years later in our life where we realize, oh my goodness, this is what I've been involved in. For sure. But so, 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 and I totally agree with you completely. I think too, though, in the history of interpretation, some of these interpretive strategies were done in medieval ages, you know, a long time ago, even before some were done in the Protestant, you know, kind of uh, agitations and things like this. But, you know, they were also originated in a society that was actively doing atrocities. So, you know, something like Calvin's Geneva was not a great place to be if you were a Jew. And, um, and so he had interpretive strategies that I talk about in the book. And I don't think we can divorce the treatment of so-called outsiders in Geneva with the ways they interpreted the Bible. They're of a piece, is what I'm trying to say too, is that we don't, these interpretive strategies and these readings of the Bible are not abstract, they're not apart from us. They're embedded within particular cultures, within particular peoples, within particular communities, and they're designed to accomplish goals. They're not neutral. And so what I also try to do is say, let's examine what our reading strategies are accomplishing. And, and to say, is that a good thing? Is that not a good thing? And let's try to design reading strategies that are loving and beneficial and helpful and are, are not producing harm. So, so to that, this brings me back to um, the question about holding together contradictory portraits. Um, and I'm reminded of a of a review that Dennis Olson wrote of Walter Brueggemann's Old Testament theology, where he he advocates this sort of um, courtroom metaphor where different witnesses come forward, and the Old Testament is like that courtroom where you have different witnesses, and the, those voices are not merged or harmonized. And and Dennis Olson said, "Okay, I understand the model." But Brueggemann's sort of final reading is that God is ultimately just and loving, and he, and that goes against Brueggemann's own reading of some of those other voices. So, so your depiction there of a God that leads us to loving, charitable action in the world is at odds with some of the strands you discern in Scripture. 
So is that, to what extent is that holding together the contradictions? And to what extent is that choosing a particular line of thought within oh, yeah. the Bible? No, yeah. no, you, yeah, yeah, you're totally right. I, I did choose a particular line of thought, so for sure. But that also, in, in, in one sense, isn't a problem for me, because I think there are multiple lines of thought that we can take about God simultaneously. And so um, that's fine in, in my conception. I think, secondly, um, it it does contradict who God is in moments. And I guess I'm trying to read and imagine God charitably, where God lashed out in anger and um, overdid it in punishment at times, in my reading of certain biblical passages. However, it seems that after the fact, God does express regret, like what we talked about. And so it's almost like God is self-aware after the fact of some of these moments. And so it's not like, so I am trying to like, at least say that there is a loving core to who God is, this merciful, loving core that God wants to live up to. Um, I think it would be hard for me to continue existing if I didn't think that about the universe, Mm -hmm. you know, that's just like despair. (laughs) And, uh, and, uh, and so I do want there to be this benevolent, loving core to existence. Um, and so I am kind of starting from that basis, um, just for my own sanity. Um, <laughs> but so you're right in the sense that it, it does a little bit contradict, but in one sense it doesn't because um, because I think in these stories we don't see a God who's perfect in the platonic conception. So it may be perfect in Hebrew conception, which I think is different. So, uh, so my understanding of perfection in kind of uh, Hebrew thought is more integrity, uh, completion, maturity, things like that. And so um, in that moment, God was acting as good as God could act in one sense, just like all of us in a sense, like, I think there are very few people in the world who just want to be a bastard, you know? Most of us want to, you know, do right by us in the world, and we want to live up to our best selves, but we don't often. And I think in one sense, that's what I see in some of these biblical stories as well. And then after the fact, God, like with Noah, puts a rainbow in the sky to say, man, remind me to be better you know, inspire my, and that's, that's the fascinating, the rainbow is not there for humanity, according to the Genesis text. It's there to remind God of God's commitment to um, not overreact next time. Hmm. You say that in the book that um, the character qualities of Jesus aren't to be seen as temporary add-ons to Christ's divine nature, but natural manifestations of the ways that God has always always been. What, what do you mean by that? Um, I think in Christian circles, Jesus is this really weird phenomenon that we can't really explain. And that's fine. Again, I'm fine with mystery. I'm fine with that kind of stuff. But I'm also a curious person who likes to crack the nut if I can. And uh, so I think there are these fundamental things about Jesus, like what we talked about earlier of Jesus learning through suffering, you know, growing through that, gaining in knowledge is how a lot of translations frame that, that remain opaque for us unless we get a glimpse of God's fundamental character already revealed in the Old Testament. And so, yeah, where was I going? Well, just the, 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 those things being <laughs> um, a kind of natural manifestation of the way oh, God's yeah. always mm-hmm. been. So, yeah, yeah. it's those so, point, points yeah. of continuity between points, mm-hmm. incarnation, I guess, yeah. and God as revealed in Old Testament. And so the traditional way to go about the, trying to explain Jesus is to have a really stark uh, separation between Jesus' human side and Jesus' divine side. Then everything that seems human-like, you throw in the human side, and everything that seems transcendent and stuff, you throw into the God side. And if Christian theology is really going to be robust and good, I don't think that bifurcation can hold up. And even in classical Christian doctrine, you know, you, you can't separate Jesus out that much. Those are so-called heresies, and I'm not really keen on that word or designation, but it's there in Christian tradition. And so Jesus is this holistic entity, this both 100% divine, 100% uh, 
um, God in Christian conception. And so what's that mean? I think part of what that means is that Jesus is not going to be some weird new phenomenon that we've never seen before in Scripture. But I think that's somewhat how he's been characterized in the history of theology. And instead, it's um, sort of this full flowering um, of who God is in this individuated, embodied form. And so there's much more continuity with the God of the Old Testament and with this kind of Christian depiction of Jesus that's there and should be there for Christians to find um, than I think we've historically uh, made room for. You know, I've said sometimes in class that the incarnation is not an aberration in the in, or a disruption in the life of God, but, but rather a natural extension of what God's already been up to. I mean, think, think of like the emphasis from the beginning of God being with the people, being present among them, being visibly present. And so it's not like, oh, they screwed it up so bad, I need to come down and sort it out. But, but rather, th there's this incarnational impulse at work throughout the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, uh, Charles, thank you so much for um, taking the time to speak with me today and to talk about your book, A Human-Shaped God, uh, Theology of an Embodied God. Um, so we uh, wish you all the best in your ongoing work and ministry. Thanks. Appreciate being here, Matt. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study slash donate.